Russia lost territory in 1915. Miles of territory, thousands of miles of territory to the Austro-German Colossus. Russia now needed someone to beat, and if it couldn't happen in the north, then Russia would turn her attention far to the south. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to The Great War. Last week, the invasion of Montenegro by Austro-Hungarian forces was complete, and they then attacked Albania, while the Allies were working hard to evacuate the remainder of the Serbian army from Albania to Corfu. The western, eastern, and Italian fronts were quiet, but at home in Germany, anti-American sentiment was growing, and in Greece, the Allies were building up their forces in violation of Greek neutrality. The Western Front may have been fairly quiet on the front lines, but behind the lines there was a lot going on. German Army Chief of Staff Erich von Falkenhayn was setting up for his plan to bleed the French Army to death at Verdun. He was going to attack Verdun in the belief that its national symbolism was so great the French would have no choice but to defend it to the end. The attack was scheduled for February 12th. The German Fifth Army had built ten new railway lines and a couple dozen railway stations. Trainloads of steamrollers and road building equipment were on the move. Whole villages behind the lines were evacuated to make room for the hundreds of thousands of men arriving for the attack. Just one corps was outfitted with over a million sandbags and over half a million pounds of barbed wire. But it was, of course, the artillery that was the real focus here. Big guns were brought in from as far away as Russia and the Balkans, over 1,200 of them, to attack on a front barely eight miles long. These included 13 Big Bertas. With a caliber 17 inches, they fired shells that weighed over a ton, and when they were fired, the concussion broke windows for several kilometers around. These were the guns that had shattered the impregnable fortress of Liège in 1914. Two 15-inch long-distance naval guns were also brought in, as well as 17 Austrian 305 mm mortars and loads of the quick-fire and 210s, which would become, to the French, the most familiar gun at Verdun. 150s, 130s, mine throwers, they all came by the hundreds, and one other weapon that would make its large-scale debut at Verdun, the flamethrower. By February 1st, all of the guns were in place. Now, all of this is a lot to conceal from the enemy, but the Germans were helped by the wooded and broken countryside. Also, they set the artist Franz Marc to work painting camouflage canvas and nets, and where there were no trees, these were draped over the roads and ground. There were other big changes from the battles of 1915. For one, there were underground concrete galleries called Stollen. See, surprise had been lost earlier by cramming assault troops into the front trenches. The enemy can see when you're going to attack, and the counterattacks always did huge damage. Now, the men were to wait in shell-proof Stollen, hundreds and hundreds of them in each one. And overhead, 168 airplanes would provide a dawn-to-dusk aerial barrage that would prevent the French from sending any aircraft to spy on the German positions. This would be the first aerial umbrella the world had seen. But the war in the skies was heating up the whole time. Back on January 23rd, two French air squadrons, 24 planes, bombed the railway station and barracks at Metz. These bombers were escorted by two more squadrons, and the escorts engaged in ten combats with German Fokkers. But only one French plane was damaged enough to be forced down. On the 29th, there was a Zeppelin raid on Paris. On the 31st, six Zeppelins raided East Anglia and the Midlands. They killed 70 and injured 113. And on February 1st, the first merchant ship ever sunk by aerial bombardment, the British cargo ship Franz Fischer, went down. And speaking of new forms of attack, on January 29th, the first British tank began its testing. I want to look now at a front we haven't seen much of for quite a while, the Caucasus Front. The winter had so far prevented any real activity there, except behind the lines, but no longer. This front now became, for Russia, one of major importance. For one, attacks there promised the best return for the smallest expenditure of time, men, and money. Against both Germany and Austria-Hungary, Russia had suffered severe setbacks, and the Ottomans seemed to be, comparatively, an easy opponent, even through the roadless and railless Transcaucasian mountain passes. Of course, that's what the British had thought in 1915 at Gallipoli and in Mesopotamia. 
but the German and Austrian drives had come to a stop, and they seemed to be content for the time being, just holding the front from Riga to Romania. And this breather allowed Russia to really turn her attention toward the Ottomans. And under the Grand Duke Nikolai, all was now ready for an advance upon Erzurum. This was actually a really good time for such an offensive, because all Ottoman forces available were being sent to Baghdad and then thrown into the siege at Kut, where General Charles Townsend's British Indian Army awaited relief. Taking Kut would be a major victory for the Ottoman Empire. Also, the war in the Balkans had brought the Allies to Salonika in ever-growing numbers, and the Turks had an army of over 200,000 men at or to the north of Constantinople to prevent an offensive there. So who could be diverted to the Caucasus Front? Good question. In command of the Russian forces under Nikolai was General Nikolai Udenich, who had, I'm not kidding, spent years studying the specific problems of an offensive in the Kars Erzurum region. And he would advance upon Erzurum from three points, a pincer movement combined with a frontal assault. But Erzurum was one of the strongest points in the whole Ottoman Empire, with two rings of defenses and hundreds of big guns. The Turkish plan for the defense was this. The 3rd Army Corps was moved out of Erzurum and took a position between it and the Russians. The 9th and 10th Corps moved out towards Olti to make an offensive ring, and the 11th Corps was to hold the Russians on the Kars Erzurum road. If they weren't able to do that, they would fall back as slowly as they could toward the fortress and draw the Russian forces in, after which the 9th and 10th Corps would hit their flank. Things were slowly building to a head, and the Russians advanced nearer and nearer. But what of Russia at home? What was going on there after there was so much turmoil and strikes throughout the last few months? Well, on February 1st, though the exact date is disputed in different sources, Ivan Goremikin resigned as prime minister and Boris Sturmer was appointed. Sturmer was a favorite of Rasputin, who in turn was a favorite of the Tsarina. The Tsar tasked Sturmer specifically to improve relations between the government and the Romanovs, which did not happen. The divide grew greater and greater. Sturmer, and his Germanic name didn't help things, was suspected of being pro-German and was deeply unpopular. He also ended up being prime minister, interior minister, and foreign minister at the same time, which caused many to see him as a dictator, and his short time at the helm was marked by inflation, food shortages, and an increase in Rasputin's authority. War Minister Alexei Polivanov would later call Sturmer's appointment the beginning of the end. And another week draws to a close, a week of foreboding. The Germans are gearing up for a gigantic offensive, the Russians on the move against the Ottomans, and the war in the skies growing and growing, while the Russian government becomes ever more turbulent. There was a story going around the Western Front all this winter that above a German parapet, somebody had put up a plank that said, the English are fools. British rifle fire soon destroyed the plank. Soon, another plank appeared that said, the French are fools. French rifle fire destroyed the plank. A third plank soon went up. We're all fools. Let's all go home. And though it was also shot to pieces, it caused a great deal of laughter. Correspondent Philip Gibbs wrote that men were saying, there's a good deal of truth in those words. Why should this go on? The fighting men have no real quarrel with each other, and that the men were caught in a devil's trap, and Gibbs describes the trap like this. Loyalty to our own side. Discipline with the death penalty behind it. Obedience to the laws of war. All the moral and spiritual propaganda handed out by pastors, newspapers, generals, staff officers, old men at home, exalted women, a deep and simple love for England and Germany, pride of manhood, fear of cowardice, a thousand complexities of thought and sentiment prevented men on both sides from breaking the net of fate in which they were entangled and revolting against that mutual unceasing massacre by arising from the trenches with a shout of, we're all fools, let's all go home. But they weren't fools, they were just ordinary men. Millions of them being led by fools perhaps, others perhaps not, but all of them hopelessly stuck into obedience of the laws of war. If you'd like to find out more about the Caucasian Front and how Enver Pasha lost a whole army there last year, you can check out our episode about that right here. 
Our Patreon supporter of the week is Ryan Anderson. Thanks to Ryan's support, we have improved our show tremendously. And with your support, we can make it even better. For more details, visit our Patreon page. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.